Welcome to Dig Deeper, a Leaky Foundation videocast. My name is Beth Green, and today we're talking with Dr. Adrian Zillman. Can you please state your name and the organization you're affiliated with, and also your area of study? Adrian Zillman, I'm from the University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, human evolution, really all aspects of all the different kinds of evidence we use to try to figure out what happened in the last few million years. So why is this type of research important? What can it tell us about ourselves and our evolution? One of uh, the areas that I've done a lot of research on is the comparative anatomy of apes and especially chimpanzees. And so what I've been interested in is uh, a couple of things. One is to try to understand the reorganization of the human body, sort of thinking about the apes is where we start and then reorganizing it for bipedal locomotion, for um, body composition in terms of reproduction, all of these kinds of things, and the apes make a good comparison. Then the second thing is, is trying to use that information that includes not just the bones but the soft anatomy to see what we can say about the fossils. And so what we're getting in the fossil record are isolated bones, and I always try to imagine the flesh on the bones because that has an awful lot of information for us. Who or perhaps what inspired you to get into this field of research? Oh, there's so many. I think that um, I've always been interested in natural history and in animals and plants and the kinds of things that probably Darwin looked at when he was going on his voyage, but just that basic natural history. I grew up in Chicago in uh, what we would call now, you know, a multi-ethnic neighborhood uh, in Chicago. And so when I was a freshman, I took a course in anthropology and learned about, formally about other cultures and about human evolution. So that really hooked me on the evolutionary part of, of the study. But I've always been interested also in uh, the cultural aspect. Then when I got to graduate school, my mentor Sherwood Washburn was a huge inspiration. Um, that really taught me about looking at the non-human primates, looking at the fossil record, and looking at lots of different kinds of evidence to try to answer questions. So there have been a lot of inspirations along the way. My, my grandmother um, that really taught me anatomy and my father. When I took biology in high school, we used to, we would get assignments to go around the neighborhood and identify trees in the fall and then we had to identify birds in the spring. Uh, so uh, he was always interested in a lot of the same things that I was. Have you ever had a eureka moment? What was it like? Oh gosh, there's so many. Um, that's one of the exciting things about doing research. I think one, um, a couple of them in a study that I did on chimpanzees. Um, in uh, Belgium, there's a museum outside of Brussels at Tervuren, and they have a large collection of chimpanzees, both species, because there are two species of chimpanzee. And since I had done early research on chimpanzees, I was interested in looking at the rarer uh, chimpanzee, the, what's also called the bonobo, the pygmy pampaniscus. It's its scientific name. So uh, I went there and was able to study a fairly large collection of both species of chimps together. And um, there were really two interesting eureka moments. One, this is after you go home and study and, and analyze the data. You know, you can't always see it at the time. But the two species are diff were different in the proportions of their limb bones which is very surprising because the single bones look the same, but once you lay them out in individual skeletons and do the measurements and then do the statistics, it turns out that the two species are quite different in the pattern of the, re the, pattern of the limb bones uh, and in the relationship between males and females in the two species. So they're, they were just much more different than than I had ever imagined. That was a huge surprise. 
The second surprise, also related to chimpanzees, is uh, I started doing, after I had studied all these skeletons, I decided I needed to know what's the flesh on the bones. So I started trying to get bodies to do anatomical research on with the soft anatomy, the muscles, the skin, and put it all together. So when I started working on um, pan paniscus, I knew from, from doing all the skeletal work that in terms of the bones, there's no statistical difference between males and females. But if you now put the soft tissue on and you put the muscles on, males have more muscle than females. And they uh, have different proportions of the soft tissue. They have heavier forelimbs, <laughs> which is not surprising given the human species. So, so that was really a surprise. And, and then part of this is that the, the bones are the same, the composition is different, and the body weight is really different. So the males are packing more stuff on those bones, more muscle on those bones than the females are. And that was another huge eureka. So it just keeps going like that because, you know, when you start looking at things and measuring them and then thinking about it, things just come up that you weren't necessarily expecting. I mean, if you knew the answer, you wouldn't do the research, right? So, so in a way, it's um, let's look at this and see what's going on. And that's the fun of science. Is it's really, you just don't know what you're going to find all the time. Tell me about a time you had a challenge or a setback in your research. Oh, there are lots of those. Um, the list is too long. I think that one of the things about really staying the course in science, or probably this is true for just about any profession or any uh, line of work that you decide to do, um, the, th the thing about uh, being a professional scientist, you have to expect your grants are going to get rejected. And it's very discouraging, but you just keep going. You write a paper and you may have worked for years on collecting the data, doing the analysis, writing the paper, rewriting the paper. You send it off to a journal and it gets rejected. That's very discouraging. But you just have to, okay, I'm going to just have to redo it. I'm going to have to just stay with it. And so I think that you have to kind of expect the setbacks that in turn then become challenges. Because for all of us who have stayed in this for any length of time, nobody is immune. No scientist is immune from rejection, grant rejection, mm -hmm. publications being rejected. It's really part of the game. Mm -hmm. So you just have to kind of not get discouraged. What is your favorite thing about the research you do? Um, I think it's a combination of things of um, being in the lab and just the nitty-gritty grunt work, you know, measuring, dissecting, you know, there's a lot of tedium. But when you then get some data together and you can start analyzing and thinking about it, and then combining that with the reading that you're doing and what other people are working on, because I love to read the journals and find out what other people are doing because that's, and then you see where there might be some overlap or uh, maybe some insights or maybe you're on the wrong track. So it's that combination of investigation and um, looking for connections. Mm -hmm. And for me, teaching, you know, sharing it with my students, sharing it with colleagues, I do a lot of joint research and it's really fun to have an idea and to be working on the data analysis in a paper because that's really fun. Uh, you don't really know how it's going to turn out. But it's the social activity that's really fun too. If you had a time machine, how would you use it to answer one human origins question? One of them would be going back not that long ago, but going back to Africa 
with the hunter gatherers, with with uh, the Kalahari hunter gatherers, Elizabeth Marshall Thomas, in the 50s, you know, before when they were, or maybe before that, because that's a very ancient way of life. So, a few thousand years. I would just love to be in that African uh, environment with these people, going out, gathering with the women, um, just seeing about their way of life. And probably the other one would be the going back four to five million years to the, try to see what the common ancestor, you know, how that happened. If so, that would be my second choice, would be going way back in time. What's going on here? Was the common ancestor more like a chimpanzee? Was it like something else? And exactly what was that transition that kind of set us on a different course to become Homo sapiens? So that would be my two.